Hello, Chicago. I apologize. I was out in shorts yesterday. It was about 70 degrees. So I know you guys are in a totally, it's like 100 degree temperature difference between me and you. So I real, I feel really bad. Sorry. Um, a couple messages and emails came to my attention since my last session. One, somebody I don't remember who asked a question about different forms of Zionism. And I made a new slide in the past uh, few days and I'll, you'll see it one of my early slides to kind of talk about the different streams of Zionism. And second, someone raised the issue of uh, looking perhaps at one of my slides, in particular the slide where I talked about, where I quoted Mark Twain in 1869, coming to Palestine and seeing the country desolate, um, and maybe interpreted what I was saying as suggesting that the Jewish national enterprise of Zionism was a form of colonialization. Um, and I disagree with that statement because I don't think Zionism, in contrast to a lot of other European, a lot of European colonization wasn't colonization because unlike uh, the, the British or French colonizing North America or Africa or Australia or South Africa, or you name it, um, the land of Israel, the Zionist movement was an indigenous population with historic claims to a piece of land. It doesn't necessarily mean that there wasn't another indigenous group of people, the Palestinian Arabs, who also have a claim to it. So it's a hot potato politically. I'll be happy at the end if whoever raised that question wants to go a little bit further on that. But again, I don't think Zionism was colonization. I think rather it was a uh, the possibly and the uh, former Canadian Justice Minister Irwin Kotler, you might have come across him, says very clearly that the Jewish people are the first people who have a written indigenous claim to a piece of real estate that have you know, kind of reclaimed that claim. So we can argue and, and discuss, but it's not in my eyes, at least colonization. It is a movement of national renaissance. I ended last week, I believe, um, with this, no, not this slide. This is not exactly what you want, sorry. I ended last week, where am I? With the, there we are, with the slide, I believe talking about, no, that's my next session, talking there it is, with the Arab response to the growth in Zionism and the outbreak of the Arab revolt to 39, right? These handful of events that happened in Tel Aviv. And one of the major Jewish responses in the Jewish community, what the term I don't think I used last week called the Yishuv, literally the settlement, the Jewish community in Palestine was to create settlements. There was an old Ottoman, which was then used by the British as well, regulation that essentially said, if you have a, 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 a town, village, whatever, community with a wall with a, and a uh, uh, with a tower and a stockade, kind of a fence all around it, that is considered a permanent settlement and it can't be taken down. And so 57 of these with hundreds of people, each of them involved, prefab, building the wall, building the tower, dozens of trucks coming in a matter of hours overnight, literally putting up a brand new settlement. So not necessarily reprisal raids against the Arabs, not fighting the British, but the response creating settlements. And we already saw in 1920 along the border with Lebanon, when the border was being determined between the French and the British, we saw how, um, hold on, I don't see something here. I don't know, I don't see you guys here as well. There you go, I wanna to try to see you maybe, sorry about this. Let me try to do this this way and figure out, I don't know what's going on here today, but whatever. I wanna watch you guys as well as see me, but, why am I not sharing the screen? Okay. Oh, technical problems. Sorry. Hold shift. All right, whatever. We'll try this one again. There, I can see you better now. Fantastic. Sorry, guys. There we go. Now I can see some of you to see if you can hear me, at least I can see the first four of you and I can see my presentation as well. Um, the most famous of these was Kibbutz Chanita, 1938. It's still there, it's on the border with Lebanon. Like Telechai started to mention the community in 1920, which was on the border with Lebanon where the eight people, including Joseph Trippeldor, were killed in March of 1920 and the discussion in the Jewish leadership in Tel Aviv of whether to abandon or to reinforce that community on the periphery. But this is the most famous, as I said, it's still there. You might recognize Yigal Alon on the right-hand side, one of the leaders of the Palmach, uh, contemporary of Yitzhak Rabin. Uh, you might not recognize Moshe Dayan because he doesn't have his eye patch over his left eye there. This took place before he uh, before he lost his eye. And of course, uh, Yitzhak Sadeh, the kind of man in charge of the Palmach, the elite force, well, eventually the Palmach, but at that time it was the Haganah, the biggest of the Jewish undergrounds in Palestine. So the British, as a response to the wave of Arab violence, 
issue a series of white papers. The most important part of the white paper, and here is a quote I found in my research only from 1946, but it gives you a sense of it. Already in 1939, you can see there's a white paper which limits Jewish immigration to Palestine. It continued from 39, 38, 39, up until 1948. And galling, perhaps most galling, is here in 45, in 46, August 46, a year plus after the liberation at the end of the Second World War, only 1,600 Jews a month are allowed legally to move into Palestine. So another response, which we'd already seen before the war began, was illegal immigration together with building of settlements. The idea of the white paper was calling for a national home, a Jewish national home, and an independent Palestinian state. Notice the difference in language, no Jewish state, but yet a Palestinian state, that changed later on, rejecting the idea of partitioning Palestine. Um, it was the limitation of Jewish immigration, also limitation in terms of Jewish property. Both sides, Jews and Arabs, rejected the paper, and the Jewish community launched a general strike. And eventually, as I said, they launched this massive program of constructing new settlements. Perhaps the most brilliant, I believe, Jewish response to the complex situation from 39 to 45 was that um, spoken by David Ben-Gurion, who eventually becomes the first prime minister, who has to figure out how to respond to Nazism and how to respond to the oppression of the British mandate. And he said brilliantly, we will fight with the British against Hitler as if there were no white paper with all of its restrictions, and we will fight the white paper as if there is no war. As a result of that, over 30,000 Jews from within Palestine fought with the British in the Second World War, which was invaluable in terms of their military experience um, in the War of Independence. Not all groups in the Jewish community in Palestine bought into that idea. For example, Menachem Begin, who a few years later became the leader of the Irgun Tzvalumi, or the Etzel, or the Irgun, different words to describe the same organization, called on more um, direct attacks and revolts against the British, all right? Begin ultimately um, becomes prime minister only in 1977, but I'll come back to him later soon and in a couple of weeks time as well. As I mentioned before, we have the uh, settlement response. I talked about Khanit up in the north, but I want you to see all these 11 dots one day. After Yom Kippur, the night that Yom Kippur ends, 1946, there are hundreds of people who eventually settle thousand, over a thousand people in these 11 dots. One is in Gaza, this is Gaza there, it's no longer in existence, but the other 10 are still there. Kibbutzim in Israel, ultimately this Western Negev area, very big important breadbasket in the country, is incorporated into Israel because that was where a Jewish majority population was. Um, because of this one operation, and again, 1,000 people and 200 vehicles, 11 settlements, it's a major, major operation, which was successful, as I said, in ensuring the incorporation of that part of the Negev into Israel. At the same time of settlements being built, there is this process of aliyabet, or illegal immigration. The most famous, of course, is the story of the Exodus, the boat, the former President uh, Warfield, that used to be a uh, a ferry across Chesapeake Bay, barely makes it across the Atlantic into the Mediterranean and takes 4,500 Holocaust survivors to Palestine. The British find out about the boat. They force it to land. A few people actually are killed in the process, and then they're sent back to Europe. Pretty crazy situation. Eventually, they come to Palestine in 48. Other boats, the Jewish state, the Haganah, uh, on the left-hand side, I think it's called, or no, it's just called the Jewish state. And you can see landing and docking, or not even docking. This is when the British captured them, landing as close to the shore as they can, and literally walking and swimming onto the sea. About 100,000 Jews from 45 to 48, after the Holocaust and after the Second World War is over, illegally immigrate in uh, in the period of the British Mandate. We'll see in a couple minutes time how that number becomes much, much larger, of course, in 1948. And of course, May 14th, 1948, this happens outside of the home of the first mayor of Tel Aviv, the Tel Aviv Art Museum on Diesengoff, uh, sorry, the house of Mayor Diesengoff on Rothschild Boulevard in Tel Aviv is the Declaration of Independence. There we see the first Prime Minister, David Ben-Gurion. We see some religious members. We see some uh, Marxist members on the dais, members of the provisional government. Elections are only held first in January 49. And of course, the Palestine Post, the precursor to the Jerusalem Post, announcing the birth of the Jewish state. And this famous picture um, of this young girl celebrating the fact that the Jewish people are now no longer the object of everybody else's history, but the subjects of our own story. And I should put up 
pictures of a few people we'll be meeting. We've already met Ben Gurion, Moshe Shertok, or later Moshe Sharet, the first foreign minister who becomes the second prime minister when Ben Gurion resigns in his shadow, basically, for a few years. Golda Meir, we know as Golda Meyerson, who comes from Milwaukee, and they signed this document. It's actually not the actual document because they couldn't write it on the parchment in time. They had to sign their names and then describe it to take three pieces of parchment and write the full text on and funny story. But they signed perhaps the most important Jewish document in 2000 years. Um, and this is where it would, would have ended last week, but someone asked a question and me doing my due diligence, I decided that I'd spend a couple minutes talking about the different streams of Zionism. And the first stream of Zionism, not the precursors and not the prayer of millennia, was this notion of political Zionism, as espoused by Theodor Herzl. The idea of focusing on getting diplomatic support for a Jewish state from the Ottoman Sultan, the Turkish Kaiser, from whoever, in order to provide a safe haven and a country for the Jews suffering in Eastern Europe. But he also realized, keep in mind, Herzl, that there was also an issue of anti-Semitism, even in enlightened Central and Western Europe. The second branch, is cultural Zionism. Chad Ha'am, we talked last week about Ben Yehuda, the founder of modern Hebrew, the idea that Zionism shouldn't be about creating a political entity, but this kind of national cultural revival that would become this ideal society, a light onto the nations based on the prophetic vision. Now, there is a political entity, and part of that Declaration of Independence talks about how the state of Israel will be created in the visions, according to the vision of the prophets. I spoke a lot last week about labor Zionism, these important figures, A.D. Gordon, for example, the religion of labor, the idea that the new Jewish states would be socialist, egalitarian, equal, personal and national liberation should be achieved through labor, right? We came to a land to build and to be rebuilt, this redemptive act, and this whole concept of the Trinity of the new Jew based on Jewish labor, Jewish or Hebrew language, and self-defense. Somebody was asking me at the end of last week, what about revisionist Zionism? Well, revisionist Zionism starts later, really grows in the late 20s, early 1930s, and the founder, and then really the, the one who was really most behind it was Menachem Begin, but the founder was Zev Jabotinsky, who dies uh, while traveling in the United States in 1940. And the idea, of, uh, the idea of revisionist Zionism, as its name suggests, is to revise the way we, the Jewish community in Palestine, relate to the British, more aggressive in terms of attacking and, and, and threatening the British and throwing them out, rather than, as Ben-Gurion said, helping the British in their war aims against the Germans. It was also more romantic nationalism, um, a liberal economic model, and its idea was to focus on both sides of the Jordan, not just what we would call the State of Israel today, West Bank, Gaza, whatever, but also what is today the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. A smaller group, much smaller, they had their own undergrounds, and politically they received, they take power in 1977. So it's a while from when the labor hegemony kind of begins to dissolve or disappear, only ends up in 1977. And finally, religious Zionism, I didn't talk a lot about that. Um, Rav uh, Kook uh, moves to Palestine. This idea that the Jewish state was part of God's divine plan of redemption, and as we say in our, 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 our Sidurim, in Hebrew, that Israel should be seen as Rashid Tzmichad Geulatenu, the beginning of the flowering of the headwaters of redemption. In other words, the state of Israel is part of God's divine plan. It's another step in leading toward the Messianic era. And so there are others. I could talk about Christian Zionism, which ebbs and flows, and Herzl is influenced by Christian Zionists in, in, in Europe in the, in the late 19th century. Um, modern Israel is influenced by evangelical Christian Zionists today in America. I didn't go there. I didn't even talk about anti-Zionists, but I wanted to do a little diligence and to talk about those uh, five different streams based on the question that I was asked last week. And with that, I end, if I can figure this one out here. Yes, I end part one and I go already to part two, which same guy same title except part two this time. Hopefully I'll get us right up to the 1967 Six Day War. Um, and it's pretty crazy to think that in two of six sessions, I'm already gonna get to a point where I was born. I was born in 1964, for those who haven't figured out how old I am yet. So I'm sure many, almost all of the people, if the rabbi's listening, but almost all of the people in this call might even have some re recollection of what happened in the 1967 Six Day War. Um, so you can see the beginning of this period after Israeli independence is with this massive immigration when Israel's population trebled in its first decade, and it ends with that 
very famous picture of the three paratroopers taken by David Rubinger at the Western Wall, staring up in awe after defeating three Arab countries in six days. So what I've called the challenging and miraculous, nothing short of miraculous, first two decades. And we oftentimes overlook this period because, you know, there was 48, the War of Independence, and there was a war, we'll see, in 56, the Suez Crisis, and then 67. And so much has changed in Israel from 1967. And I believe that one of the central schisms, ideological uh, rifts within Israel has to do with day seven of the Six Day War. Where do we see ourselves vis-a-vis -vis all of that territory that we conquered? It's a question that we're still answering. So we in Israel referred to this as the War of Independence. We declared independence. The UN, you'll see in the next slide, recommended creating a Jewish and an Arab state. And the day we declared independence, 4 p.m. on Friday, the 14th of May, that evening, forces from Lebanon and from Syria and from Iraq even, and from the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan and from Egypt and the Arabs within Palestine all attacked Israel. It ends with the armistice in 1949 with all of our neighbors, but not everybody between the Jordan, here's the Jordan over here, the river and the Mediterranean, use that same term. In fact, in Palestinian society, the term is used the Nakba, or the catastrophe resulting in the birth of Israel. And it led to the birth of the Palestinian refugee issue. Somewhere in the area of 750,000 Palestinians fled or were kicked out by Israel or were encouraged to leave by their own leadership, left in the midst of this war. And ultimately and tragically, they did not get a state, even though the world had promised them a state in 1947. By the time the dust cleared, 750,000 Palestinian refugees. It, by the way, is an almost identical number to the number of Jews who immigrated to Israel in the first decade. Um, and we could spend weeks discussing, debating, well, what about our refugees versus their refugees? Why does the UN still have a uh, one organization that specifically deals with Palestinian refugees? Why is someone born in Flint, Michigan, um, to you know great-grandparents who fled Palestine in 1948? Why are they still considered refugees? You spent a lot of time talking about that, but I'm not. This is the map, the United Nations Partition Plan, November 29th, 47. Lake success, some of you might even remember hearing that. I'm a little bit too young for that. But notice three entities. The light blue was supposed to be Jewish. Most of the Jewish state was the empty Negev Desert. But up here, the Upper Galilee, the area where the water sources of the Jordan, which feed the Sea of Galilee, which I'm circling around now, this area was supposed to be Jewish because of those few settlements that were already up there late 19th, early 20th century, like Tel Chai. Look what happens, though, in 1949. The armistice is agreed between Israel, you'll see in a couple slides, and the Arab countries around us. And look what happens. Here is this, this is the original map that they have, or a picture of it, obviously. And I drew these, out of these three green arrows, it's hard to see the line over here, but there is a line, and this is, um, can you see my, there's my red cursor, follow me if you want, from just north of Kibbutz and Gedi on the shore of the Dead Sea, around Jerusalem or through Jerusalem. This is the so-called green line, called that because that was where the armistice was signed with Jordan. I'll show you the territory that the Arabs lost, excuse me, to Jordan, to Israel, and to Egypt. The Arabs being the Palestinians who were denied uh, an independent state as they should have been given. One of the earliest challenges Ben Gurion has, less than two weeks after he declares independence, is trying to is trying to create a uni unified command, unity of purpose, sharing of weapons with all of the undergrounds. Now, I say all of the undergrounds because, remember, there was the Haganah, the largest, affiliated with Ben-Gurion's uh, uh, group within the Zionist movement. Um, and then there was another group called the Palmach. The Palmach, the strike force, was established by the British in 1942 in order to help prevent a possible German attack of, into Palestine. You might remember the battle between uh, the battle at El Alamein between uh, General Montgomery and Rommel, the German, uh, the German commander of the uh, of the German tank corps. Thankfully, the British won, Montgomery won, and the Nazis were pushed westward and ultimately out of out of North Africa. In order to protect Palestine, the British set up this elite force, which was disbanded shortly thereafter because they didn't need it anymore. It went underground, and the Palmach became this very elite group, much smaller than the Haganah. And many of those leaders, Yitzhak Rabin, Yitzhak uh, uh, um, 
Nu what's his name? Uh, Yitzhak Rabin in particular, Yigal Alon, sorry, who I showed you a picture of a few minutes ago, they were reluctant to follow the leadership of the Haganah. You'll see that. As were the two right of center undergrounds, the SL or the Irgun Tzvalumi, the national, um, the national kind of military branch, and another group called the Lechi and the Stern Gang. They didn't want to follow Ben Gurion's leadership. But we see these undergrounds developing over years, right? 1907, Bar Giora, Hashemar, the Watchman, 1909, finally the Haganah, and these kind of splinter. Being a Jewish community, of course, not everybody could agree on, on who was in charge, and so you had at least four significant Jewish undergrounds. Ben Gurion said, we want to unify everyone, except three of them, Yagun and Stern Gang on the right, and Pamach on the left said, absolutely not. We don't want to do that. But Ben Gurion said, we must amalgamate. And ultimately, they were all disbanded and formed into the IDF. And you see, here is the symbol of the Haganah. There is a sword and the olive branch, right? Protecting ourselves, but moving or looking toward peace. You'll see the Palmach which when it went underground, after the British disbanded it, they went and worked on kibbutz. And so there were farmers as well as soldiers, and you can see the sword with the sheaths of, of wheat, of course, symbolizing them. The Etzel, the Irgun Tzvalumi, eventually under Begin's command, at this time under Begin's command, you can see. Um, underneath it, I don't know if you can see the Hebrew, but it says, Rak Kach, only thus. And you can see, this is a map. This is Israel as we know it today, and this is the other side of Israel, or this could also be seen as Transjordan, right? The idea of the revisionist underground of the Etzel was both sides of the Jordan. My wife grew up in a very different Zionist youth movement than I did. She grew up in, in Beitar, the youth movement of the Etzel, and they would sing songs, Shtegadot, right? Two branches of the Jordan. There are not that many people in Israel today who suggest that we have both sides of the Jordan. But when these three organizations are merged into the IDF, the Tzva HaGanah Israel, Israel Defense Forces, you see the logo, the sword and the olive branch, exact copy of the Haganah, reflecting them as the biggest and most significant underground pre-48, and the Star of David symbolizing, of course, the state of Israel. That is the symbol on my kid's uniform. That is the symbol of the IDF today. It wasn't an easy process. And there are actually still people today in Israel who are traumatized by this story, the Altalena affair. Now, some of you have never heard of this. Others, including my late father-in-law and his father, who were proud revisionist Zionists, were very much appalled by and their entire lives were informed by this event in fact my late father-in-law's uncle in palestine so his his father's brother i digress a bit but my father-in-law's father moved from palestine from poland in, in the 20s to america one brother stayed in poland killed in the shoah another one came to palestine the one who was in palestine was a proud person who helped build tel aviv i met him years after I moved to Israel, I said, Simcha, so what did you do for a living? He said, I built Tel Aviv. And he meant it. The idea of not only coming from, you know, the outside of Israel, but then coming here and actually physically engaging and building, he helped build Tel Aviv. When we went to his funeral, the unveiling at his, after his funeral, his tombstone said, Rakach, and there was a picture, only thus, and there was a picture of Israel and Jordan, because he had grown up in the Beitar youth movement. Anyway, the Alta Len affair. So there's a ceasefire a few weeks into the War of Independence. And the Irgun, right, there is, keep in mind, already a unified command of the IDF by the 26th of May. June 9th, what happens? There is a ceasefire. In the meantime, the Irgun, the right of center uh, underground, led by Menachem Begin, sends a boat nicknamed the Altalena after the founder of revisionist Zionism, Jabotinsky. And it almost comes to the land, reaches the coast of Israel. There are almost a thousand volunteers and Holocaust survivors and lots and lots and lots of weapons. Ben Gurion wanted all of the weapons delivered to the new leadership. But Menachem Begin said, no, 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 no. We're going to use them for our battles. And so here you've got a unified command of the IDF as of May 26th. And one of the undergrounds is still saying, no, no, these are our weapons, not all of our weapons. Eventually, the boat lands just north of Tel Aviv, comes back to Tel Aviv, and there is a picture here, literally where the Hilton Hotel is, for those who know Tel Aviv, across on the beach, yards, you know, stones throw away from the beach, there is a battle in which 16 members of the Etzel, right of center, and three members of the Haganah are killed in this violence. Menachem Begin, 
that manages the leader. He's on the boat. He manages to get off the boat, and he says, Jew will not shoot at fellow Jew. And this very famous uh, radio announcement that night. But Ben-Gurion says the following. He said, this was an attempt from Ben-Gurion's perspective to destroy the army and kill the state. If the army and state surrender to an independent force, the government might just as well pack up and go home, right? Stressing the importance of unity of command. All of us want to avoid bloodshed. There's room. There's no room for negotiations. They must turn the ship over to the government and accept the authority of the army. It is our army, the people's army, he meant. If they do so, there will be no battle. If the affair is really over, there will be an amnesty. But there is no room for compromise or negotiations. The future of the war is at stake. He meant the war of independence, not the possible civil war within Israel. Danny Gordas, um, uh, a, a American-born Jerusalem academic, writes his biography of Begin, and he talks a lot about this incident, um, suggesting in his biography that uh, it was more Menachem Begin than Ben-Gurion who was trying to reach some sort of appeasement and agreement. But tragically, almost 20 people lost their lives, Jews shooting at fellow Jews, and all the weapons, of course, sunk to the bottom of the Mediterranean. But ultimately, there was a unified leadership. January 49, first elections in Israel, there is Menach, there is Menachem Begin, there is uh, Ben Gurion um, speaking at an election rally. Almost 87% turnout, which is phenomenal when you think about it. Even in the Arab sector, you can see this is in Nazareth uh, voting because the Arabs who were in Israel, about one sixth of the population, then and today about one fifth of the population, were granted citizenship. They had the right to vote from the beginning. They were under military rule until 1966, but they were allowed to vote and they sat in parliament. Here you see the first cabinet. You might recognize Ben-Gurion. There is Foreign Minister Sharet. We've seen him before. And you recognize her with her handbag, carefully stowed. It's not Louis Vuitton, by the way. Carefully stored under the cabinet desk of Golda Meir. Look at the election results and see the parties. There are about 21 parties. Um, I think about a dozen or so. Here's the list. One. There are 120 seats in the parliament. One, enough seats to be represented in the Knesset. And Ben-Gurion's government is formed with his party, left of center socialist Mapai, and is formed with not this party, Mapam, which is a Marxist further to the left party, but yes, with a united religious front, the precursor to the National Religious Party, many of you are familiar with. Together with the Progressive Party, there are five seats, the Sephardic Party, and a Democratic Arab Party of Nazareth. Government of 73. Who's the main opposition? Here is Menachem Begin in the Herut movement, 14 seats in the general Zionist seven seats. So already, as I said, continuing from the late 19th, early 20th century, the political power was mostly with Ben Gurion and the left, the various amalgamation of left of center parties. So later that year, there are discussions uh, already, sorry, with the time of the election until the summer, there are discussions in Jerusalem. Here you see Moshe Dayan with the Jordanian delegation over there discussing There, you can hear me now. Beth, give me a thumbs up. So I keep calling Beth. Hey, no, Beth, and B, she's one of the four screens that I see on my screen. So here you can see a young Yitzhak Rabin in Rhodes, armistice, not peace discussion between Israel and the surrounding Arab countries. And notice what happens. The borders are very different. This area, Gaza, over here, is under Egyptian occupation. And this area, the West Bank and East Jerusalem, is under Jordanian occupation, and Jordan actually annexes all of the West Bank. Now, Jerusalem was supposed to be on this map over here. You can see Jerusalem was supposed to be this area here that was going to be under uh, international rule, right? And ultimately it becomes under Israeli rule, this part over there, and this pink part becomes under Jordanian rule. So this color-coded map on the left is very confusing. I want you to understand one thing. The light blue was supposed to be Israel, the Jewish state, according to the UN of 47. And look how much bigger it is. Because all these other areas, and the green, sorry, is the area that becomes Palestinian, where Palestinians live, but under Jordanian here, and Egyptian occupation, including Jaffa. So anything that is pink was supposed to be an Arab country of the indigenous Arab population in Palestine, denied to them, largely by the... Arab countries who occupy them, and by the Armistice Agreement, which was not signed with the Palestinians, but signed with the Arab countries. And Jerusalem 
perhaps the most difficultly, was a divided city, essentially two cities. You could not go from one side to the other unless you were clergy or visiting diplomat. Here was this Mandelbaum gate, so-called because this house was owned by the Mandelbaum family, and through this front porch was where you can see over here, you see the nuns coming back from Jordan into, uh, into Jerusalem, uh, into the Israeli side of Jerusalem, anomalous situation from 48 to 67. And here we have, I have a couple maps to try to give you, you can look at either one, um, to try to give you a better understanding of the situation, I'll focus on one, from 48 to 67. All that is dark blue in this map is Israel, looking to the west, to the left toward Tel Aviv. This is the main highway coming up. Everything else that is light blue is Jordan. So to the south of Jerusalem, to the north of Jerusalem, and to the east of, sorry, Israeli Jerusalem is Jordan. The Jerusalem under Israeli control is delineated by this yellow line. The Jerusalem under Jordanian control is delineated by this pink line, including all of the old city. That's the situation, and Israel always was concerned from 48 to 67 that Jordan could easily, in a pincher movement, cut across here and isolate the rest of Jerusalem. What happens after 1967? The city of Jerusalem becomes a much larger city, incorporates the Israeli pre-67 Jerusalem in yellow and the Jordanian in pink Jerusalem and makes it a much larger city. So the blue here is pre-67 Israel, the Jerusalem, the brown is pre-67 Jordan, and everything else one sees here is part of the city in its gerrymandered, it's a word sensitive to many of you, I'm sure, gerrymandered by Israel after 1967. Now, it's very confusing because we oftentimes hear, and I'm going to the present, of Jewish settlement or Arabs in East Jerusalem. The term East Jerusalem is a bit of a misnomer because East Jerusalem refers to anything beyond this green line, the pre-67 border. So this over here, although it was empty by and large from 48 to 67, and there are Jews and Arabs living there now, this is considered East Jerusalem, but it's north. The neighborhood of Gilo, some of you I'm sure have visited, is southern Jerusalem over here. East Talpiot is over here. So Gilo is south. It's very, very, very confusing. That's why I challenge to try to break down the terminology. But I go to the present. I don't want to confuse you too much. I want you to understand this is the crazy situation until 67 of Jerusalem. There's the old city. This is the beautiful Mamela shopping mall for those who have been there, right? Outside the David Citadel Hotel. This was how it looked for 19 years, because this was no man's land. Jordanian soldiers were on the wall of the old city. And here, right where there used to be a pharmacy, for those who remember it, and on the other side is a Roladin coffee shop, where they have the best souvganiyot for, for Hanukkah, for those who have been here, right over there, literally. This is the path to the old city we take today. But a sign over there said, no passage, frontier ahead, danger, don't go any farther. It didn't mean kids didn't throw balls in it and whatever else. This is a picture many of you recognize, I'm sure Beth does, because it's taken across the street from the David Citadel Hotel, looking up to the YMCA and the Hebrew Union College and beyond that, the King David Hotel. This is how it looked until 67. He recognized the YMCA, danger, frontier ahead, crazy. There was no David Citadel Hotel there, right on the edge of the border and it was crazy 19 years. What happens in the first 25 years of Israel. Today I'm focusing again only until 1967, but one of my major sources for this presentation was a book written by a man you probably never heard of named Nisim Mishal, who put this book together on Israel's 50th anniversary in 1998. Nisim Mishal was born in Iraq, 1948 or 49, I think, and he comes when he's one year old, shortly after Israeli independence. He grows up in a slum, a ma'abara, kind of a township of tents that become shacks in Talpiot in Jerusalem, very well-respected Israeli journalist. And he describes the first decade of Israel as this period of togetherness, something I talked a little bit about last week. As he says, the years of collective being, of absorbing immigrants and settling the land and making the desert flourish and building the IDF. We've talked a lot about that. And again, for those who question whether you know my presentation of labor Zionist is what I call, I might not have used this term last week, the um, Mayflower generation, the foundational generation that set in place so much of the foundations of the future state of Israel. This is the period where the new immigrants are being, uh, are, are tried to be by the founding generation, 
socialized in their image. He says, the country was ruled by the social values of the working settlers, dressed in khaki. We saw those pictures last week. In those years, the group was holier than the family, the we more than the me. And then he talked about the Sabra, the mythological figure, boyish and romantic, veiled in dreams, feverishly in search of himself, seeking self-fulfillment in the collective. Think of Yitzhak Rabin, the classic you know, Sabra. Seeking, and it's a brilliant line he used, that's why I quoted it, seeking self-fulfillment in the collective. The only way they can really fulfill who you are is in the context of the we. Fascinating. And I think Israel is still much more there than America is today. But again, we can talk about that a little bit later. The biggest priority, the ingathering of the exiles, one of the raison d'etre of the state of Israel. Um, two pictures, one of Holocaust survivors. You've probably seen this picture and some of the others that I'll show you. To me, it's a personal story, actually. This man over here named Eli Adelis, my late uncle. He survived, the only family member of his from Poland to survive the Holocaust, comes to Palestine as a young man. And I know it's a stage picture because they're not right out of the camps. They'd already been in Israel for a while. Survivors of Buchenwald, um, he never shared his story. But I do know that he has three kids, my first cousins, um, one of whom is a Chabad Hasid in Melbourne. And he probably is about 35 to 40 descendants now. He passed away in the late 1970s. But massive immigration of uh, Holocaust survivors, but a quarter of a million um, from Europe alone. Look at the numbers. Um, by the first, by 1953, five years, over 725,000 immigrants had come. The second group, even bigger than the first group, is up until the 1950s from North Africa. Here you see, and, and uh, not just North Africa, but from across the Middle East, from Morocco and Algeria and Tunisia and Libya and Egypt and Lebanon and Syria, and of course, Iraq and Iran and Yemen some from India as well, Mizrahim or Sephardim, um, probably about 750,000. So you've got over a million immigrants from 48 to 58. By 1958, the country is three times its Jewish population as it was before at the moment of independence. And these famous pictures of Yemenite families coming from Yemen to Aden, which was still a British uh, protectorate or colony or whatever it was at the time, literally on wings of eagles, they knew their Bible, and in the Bible it said that when the Messiah comes, God will take us back to the land of Israel on the wings of eagles. Now, we call these airplanes. They didn't fully realize what they were when they saw them, but they came, they landed, and they were put in these tent communities, which eventually became shacks, which eventually became public housing estates. Um, this one, for example, Rosh Ha'an. You might not have heard of Rosh Ha'in. It's close to the airport, not too far from where I speak to you now. Rosh Ha'in is two very famous residents today. One is uh, Wonder Woman. You might know Gal Gadot grew up there. And the other is Benny Gantz, the defense minister and potential uh, pr future prime minister of Israel. Pictures of Yemenite Jews um, in the tents, not very great conditions. When it rains in Israel, it rains for a very short time. Lots of puddles, lots of mud lots of huge issues and just trying to think of a country i make the comparison to america you know if america were to go from i don't know yeah well it's good math 330 million americans today imagine that in 2032 in 10 years time america would be a billion people because it would get for every american today two america two new immigrants to america imagine the challenges that that would place on america all the more so for a country like Israel, which didn't have good neighbors as Mexico and Canada, remember I'm Canadian, but rather had problematic situation on all of our fronts because we never even signed a peace treaty in 49. We only had armistice agreements. The biggest challenges had to do with foreign currency and money and food, of course. Imports were only a third of the exports of the country, different than the situation today. Very little foreign currency. Um, and ben Gurion, his government established a ministry of rationing and supply. So food and eventually furniture and clothing was rationed. However, if you lived in an agricultural settlement, the kibbutz, for example, or the moshav, which were socialist, and they had their own chickens and their own cow sheds and a lot of their own agricultural produce as well, they got along a lot better. And there were, unfortunately, black markets that developed as well. This period of austerity, or the tsena, in Hebrew, ended with the reparations agreement with Germany in 1952. Problematic, we'll see that in a couple minutes' time. Um, it almost led to a second civil war in Israel, by the way. Eventually, 11 years after Israeli independence, it was totally ended. Here's a picture of the 
neighborhood that Nisim Mishal grew up in, the Ma'abara, the, I call it a slum, the public housing estate, the tents became the shacks, the shacks then became public, really poorly built apartments in on the peripheries of most major cities, and like Tel Aviv and Jerusalem and Haifa, and then a lot of new cities, development towns on the periphery, particularly on the border with Lebanon, Jordan, and of course down next to Gaza. Here you see people waiting in line with their ration cards. And here it is. Here is the, the plan for the rations in June of 1956. How much rice in Hebrew, how much coffee, how much tea, how much milk chocolate, very important by the way, uh, how much uh, you know pure cocoa powder you could have, oils, eggs, everything was down there. And so really for much of the first decade, food was rationed, foreign currency was rationed, a very, very difficult period to deal with that massive uh, immigration. The German reparations question comes into play as the Chancellor of West Germany, Konrad Adenauer, says in the fall of 1951, he publicly says that unspeakable crimes have been committed in the name of the German people, and he calls for moral and material indemnity, both to individual Jews and in terms of Jewish property, which there is no legitimate individual heir. So that should go to the state of Israel or the Jewish people. And the first steps have already been taken in 1951. Very much remains to be done. Ben-Gurion, prime minister at the time, speaks in terms of a different Germany. However, the leader of the opposition, Menachem Begin, is appalled by this idea. He says this is nothing more than an attempt by the Germans to play to pay for its sins, to play blood money for its sins. Right? Have you killed and taken possession? A quote from a biblical story where the prophet Elijah um, rebukes King Ahab for having one of his vassals basically be killed by his wife because uh, she was jealous over the beautiful vineyard that he owned. There's a massive protest as they're about to vote in the Knesset. Rocks fly, a lot of threats of violence. Eventually, the Knesset passes by a vote of 61 to 50, the reparations. And as I say about most issues around here, it's very complicated. It almost led to civil war. Should we accept blood money on the one hand? On the other hand, but this is essential foreign currency needed. And 15% of the GDP in Israel's first decade was from German reparations. Without that, who knows if Israel would have lasted that very challenging first two, uh, first two decades. There's Menachem Begin in front of this massive crowd. You can see there's Begin on the right speaking. This is in, in a hotel at the foot of uh, Zion Square where Jaffa Road meets ben, uh, ben Yehuda Street in Jerusalem. You might know what I'm talking about. They have the protest and then they walk up the block and they start to throw rocks. Ben Gurion is actually injured in the Knesset, but there is no coup, and ultimately they narrowly pass the reparations agreement. There are a lot of events that happen in, uh, in a couple of years after that. Ben-Gurion resigns in 53. Moshe Shertog, there he is, signing the Declaration of Independence, becomes the second prime minister. The problem was he, Ben-Gurion never kind of relinquished his uh, moral authority, shall we say. And he, a couple of years later, came back in August of 55 from his self-imposed exile in the desert. Moshe Dayan becomes the defense minister, later referred to by Ariel Sharon, a future prime minister that under the baton of Dayan, he turned the IDF into an offensive army rather than just a defensive army. 1956, there was the famous trial of Kastner. Um, I'm not gonna go, it's very complicated, but this man Kastner had organized, uh, negotiated with the Nazis, had organized a train in which over a thousand Jews were saved from Hungary, um, but there were people who were, uh, he, he tried someone for libel, this guy named Malkiel Grunwald, who claimed that Kastner had cooperated with the Nazis. The uh, court basically ruled that, um, in, on the one hand, in favor of Kastner, but against Kastner, um, in that he said he did negotiate with the Nazis. But years later, after Kastner was murdered, the court posthumously ruled in his favor at a later appeal. It's a crazy story. The granddaughter, by the way, of Kastner is a woman named Merav Micheli, who was our transportation minister and currently the head of the Labour Party. Go figure. 1956, tension escalating on the border with Egypt. There is Moshe Dayan reading a eulogy to a young soldier named Roy Rodenberg, who was in charge of security on a kibbutz next to Gaza. Don't read everything here, but he describes in his eulogy a very, very, uh, I'd say a watershed event in understanding the challenges of the new Israeli state. Yesterday, Adon Roy was murdered. 
the quiet of the spring morning blinded him, etc. Let us not cast blame today on the murderers. What can we say against their terrible hatred of us? For eight years now, they have been sat in the refugee camps of Gaza and have watched how, before their very eyes, we have turned their land and villages where they and their forefathers previously dwelt into our home. He continues, it is not amongst the Arabs of Gaza, but in our own midst we meet, must seek Roy's blood. How did we shut our eyes and refuse to look squarely at our faith and see in all its brutality the fate of the generation? Let us today, listen to this line, take stock of ourselves. We are a generation of settlement, and without the steel helmet and the gun's muzzle, we will not be able to plant a tree and build a house. This is our choice, to be ready and armed, tough and hard, or else the sword shall fall from our hands and our lives will be cut short. Very, very um, harsh to hear Diane saying that, of course, but it helps us understand already in the first decade, Israel recognized very heavy price and security had to pay because of the anger, resentment, whatever term you want to use, frustration of the Palestinians, not those within Israel so much, but those outside of our border fences. And that, of course, is an issue that has not died down in that same neighborhood in Gaza, which is today ruled by Hamas. The second major war that Israel is involved in is something called the Sinai Campaign. In 1956, President Nasser, who led a coup in Egypt in 1952, deposing King Fahd, decides to nationalize the Suez Canal. You know what happens to a supply chain, it happened just a few months ago in the world, when the Suez Canal is blocked by some bad boat driver for weeks, and all of a sudden the stuff you're ordering from Asia is stuck in the Suez Canal, and it wreaks havoc on the world economy. Now, at the time, the British and French owned the Suez Canal, and they were very upset that Nasser nationalized it, basically saying goodbye to them. So they managed, with using Israel in this operation they called Musketeer, to launch an attack. 170 Israeli soldiers were killed in this eight-day-long attack. Eventually, America and the Soviets exerted pressure to withdraw. They called the bluff of the British and the French. And they set up a special United Nations expeditionary force in Sinai to keep the peace. From Israel's perspective, it was a success, though, because ships could now get into the southern port of Eilat, and it stopped the attacks from Arab terrorists from Sinai into, uh, from Gaza, sorry, into Israel. But all, unfortunately, we'll see next week, it led to the creation of Fatah, the major branch of the Palestine Liberation Organization, and new terror attacks in the north from Lebanon and Syria. It also is the beginning of the end of British influence in the Middle East. Some of the pictures of the Israeli airplanes, the landing. It's the last time paratroopers, both of my, well, one didn't, but both were supposed to jump from airplanes in part of their training in the IDF, but no Israeli has parachuted in action since this operation in 56. There is Defense Minister Diane uh, decorating some of the soldiers after the war. And here I downloaded this from the internet, a cute little a short two-minute movie of the Suez crisis, which perfectly encapsulated in Universal International News. Brought to you by Mike. Suez Canal, storm center of controversy for weeks, now becomes a cause of war in a lightning sequence of diplomatic and military moves. Since its seizure and nationalization by President Nasser of Egypt, the vital waterway has precipitated a new crisis in the already tense Middle East. Cracked French units are embarked at Marseille, bound for a joint staging area with Great Britain on Cyprus. Less than an hour's flight from Egyptian ports, where they are prepared for seizure of the canal by force. Simultaneously, Britain reinforces its garrison on the island for the same eventuality. A naval concentration in the eastern Mediterranean strengthens the military buildup, even as Israel, in a lightning attack, thrusts deep into Egypt to the vicinity of the canal. France and Britain issue a 12-hour ultimatum that all fighting must cease. Within hours of its exploration, Britain's warplanes are winging their way to Egypt, and its bombers attack five key cities, including Cairo. Following a Security Council veto by Britain and France of a United States motion for a ceasefire, President Eisenhower, after consultation with Secretary of State Dulles, makes a firm declaration of United States policy. 
United States was not consulted in any way about any phase of these actions, nor were we informed of them in advance. In the circumstances I have described, there will be no United States involvement in these present hostilities. I therefore have no plan to call the Congress in special session. Arriving from the west to avoid frontal attacks on densely populated areas, Israeli forces from the Sinai Desert occupy the troubled Gaza Strip, taking early precautions that keep to a minimum incidents that could provoke bloodshed, a peaceful occupation that allows the native populace maximum freedom. Later, after a flight on a reconnaissance plane over the Sinai Peninsula, Movitone News visits with the Israeli troops, which defeated the Egyptians in this desert no-man's land. Considered an act of self-preservation, the expedition results in the fall of the Egyptian fortress at Sharem el Sheikh, which was firing on shipping bound for Israel. It yields thousands of prisoners to the victorious forces, with $40 million worth of battle equipment which Cairo recently received from Soviet Russia. Rating cheers for General Moshe Dayan, Israeli Commander-in-Chief. I put this video on because... Sorry. Next. Because most of us, again, 1956 is kind of this black hole, but it was an important operation. It's fascinating because America didn't have the strong alliance that it has with Israel today, of course, and Britain and France kind of this really began to mark the beginning of the end of their involvement uh, in the Middle East and the age, the end of the age of empire. Within Israel domestically, there's a lot of tension growing, particularly out of the Sephardic Mizrahi community, Jews from across the Middle East, who, it's not that they weren't Zionists, but they weren't politically involved in the Zionist movement. They've been praying for thousands of years to return to the land of Israel. But they came in, and as I said a few minutes ago, they were forcibly socialized to be like the founding generation. And there was a lot of issue going on, and it's still a major issue within Israeli society today. And the first ethnic, domestic, Jewish, Jewish violence takes place in Wadi Salib, Salim in Haifa, about 15,000 Jews from Morocco, settled in uh, partially destroyed houses that were abandoned by Arabs who fled or were kicked out in 1948. Um, and they arrested, the police arrested a, a, a drunk hoodlum, Yaakov El Karif in the neighborhood, led to this massive uh, social protest in this neighborhood and across the country here you can see waving the israeli flag 1959 um, and there were close to a million jews who came from large families without post high school education or even high school education without financial resources um, and the establishment sent them to the periphery into the poor neighborhoods in the larger cities in squalid conditions and ultimately the leadership, pre-48 leadership, said that they refer to them oftentimes as the generation of wilderness or human dust. They had to lose their Mizrahi, their Sephardic backwardness, and then they could integrate into Israel. This became the symbol of the feeling of the deprived sector of Israeli society. Another movement arises in 71, the Black Panther movement. And when Golda Meir met with them when she was prime minister, she said, these are not nice boys. So you've already got 12, 11 years into Israeli independence, the ethnic genie within Jewish society is out of the bag. Spring of 1940, of 1960, Ben-Gurion back again as prime minister, Konrad Adenauer, chancellor of West Germany, meet at the Waldorf Astoria in New York. The reparations agreement passed in 52, they meet in 60, and only in 65 are diplomatic relations finally signed between the two countries. And shortly after this meeting in March, uh, Israel declares that it has discovered Adolf Eichmann living under the pseudonym Ricardo Clement in Argentina. Yisar Harel, the director of the Mossad, says we must capture him. Ben Gurion realizes it's not just about trying Eichmann, it's about this historic value and having the person who's largely the chief bureaucrat of the final solution brought on trial. Not his trial, but the trial of the Shoah. Harel, the head of the Mossad, says the following. Why do it during such a challenging period for Israel, right? All the internal issues with that massive growth of population and social issues, undertaking such a risky international operation, which could have jeopardized the relations with Argentina and other South American countries. We kidnapped this guy. I mean, we didn't get there. There was no extradition treaty. We drugged him, kidnapped him, drugged him, put him on a plane as a sick LL, a flight attendant, and he's brought back to Israel. It was called upon to perform an act of supremist or justice to hold a public trial about the Shoah. Capturing Achman was not an end, it was merely a means, the trial of the Holocaust. 
what happens. May 23rd, Ben Gurion announces Eichmann has been incarcerated in the country. His trial is going to be here. He never denied the charges. Here you can see him behind the glass in Jerusalem. And Eichmann, um, for the first time, when the trial is held in Jerusalem, for the first time, the Shoah Holocaust becomes public. Survivors who came to Israel, the quarter of a million in the first decade after the war, were largely quiet, forced to be quiet by the founding generation. Much like the Sephardic Mizrahi Middle Eastern immigration was felt that they were treated as second class citizens by the pre-state establishment elite, that Mayflower generation, so too the Holocaust survivors. But when Gideon Hausner, the government attorney general, begins the trial, he says the very, very powerful statement, which kids in the 60s used to actually have to memorize. When I stand before you here, judges of Israel, invoking that biblical notion of the judges, to lead the prosecution of Adolf Eichmann, I'm not standing alone. With me are six million accusers, but they cannot rise to their feet and point an accusing finger toward them who sits in the dock and cry, Jacuz, quoting Emile Zola, the French polemicist who accuses the French military establishment of unnecessarily, we talked last week about, uh, framing Captain Alfred Dreyfus. For their ashes are piled up on the hills of Auschwitz in the fields of Treblinka and are strewn in the forests of Poland. Their graves are scattered throughout the length and breadth of Europe. Their blood cries out, but their voice is not heard. Therefore, I will be their spokesman, and in their name, I will unfold the terrible indictment. Under the law, trying Nazis and their helpers, over 100 survivors testified Eichmann, the, the, the court finds, quote, the defendant acted out of deep identification with the orders he was given and a strong desire to attain his criminal goal, sentenced to death, carried out in June of 62, and his ashes were strewn across the Mediterranean. Now, that was the beginning of the 1960s. But look at all these other events as I approach the end, and I'm going to go over to some Q&A. Ben-Gurion retires, Levi Eshkol becomes the prime minister and the, uh, becomes the prime minister and the defense minister. The PLO is established by the Arab League in 1964 to, quote, carry out the role in liberating the homeland and determining their destiny and to liquidate Israel, establishing a Palestine Liberation Army. This guy over here, Shag Nun, receives the Nobel Prize for Literature in 66. Tension escalates between Israel and Syria over the national water carrier, a plan you'll see in the next slide to bring water from the north in the Sea of Galilee down to that empty Negev desert where a lot of agriculture is grown. In 65, Eli Cohen, after being captured, the famous spy, see the movie on Netflix with Sasha Baron Cohen, came out a couple years ago, is put on trial. So Agnon winning the Nobel Prize. Israel ends the military rule in 66. And Syria and Egypt leading up to next week. Senate Defense Pact in 66. The PLO incursions from Jordan and Syria throughout late 66, early 67. Israeli retaliation, dogfights, and tension begins to escalate between Israel, Egypt, and the PLO. Two, two last slides before I go to Q&A. This is the National Water Carrier, which brings water from the Sea of Galilee over here, down overground, underground to Rosh Ha'ain, that famous place where Wonder Woman lives and where the Ma'abara, the, uh, uh, the, interment, the camp for new Jews from Yemen, is built in the late 40s, early 50s. And from here, water goes down to the Negev. And here, massive project, this is the old five shekel note, some of you might be familiar, with Levi Eshkol, which is, um, shows you here, under his regime, he built the, he opened the Israel Museum over there and the Knesset. But on the other side of the entire bill is this national water carrier. He was in charge of the program to bring water from the lush north down to the south. And with that, I see one, Rabbi Albert, two more slides, because two major events, forget this, two major events happen leading up to 67, and that is the opening of the Israel Museum, those who have been there, and uh, it, it doesn't look like this today, on this kind of western edge of Jerusalem, there is the shrine of the book over there, opens in May of 65, and across the street, the Israeli Knesset, there's the museum, across the street, the Knesset opens in 1966. What does it say about a society? Its National Museum opens a year before the Knesset opens up. This is the joy, the excitement, 19 years, 18 years after Israeli independence. But as your local paper says, on June 7th, where are you here? I'll go back to this next slide next week. War breaks out in the south, right from the Trib on the 5th, sorry, the, yeah, the 5th of June, 1967. And with that, please, Q&A until next week.
If Thanks so much, Mike. If um, again, I don't know how you get all of that information into <laughs> such a short period of time, but that was amazing. Thank you. Um, for those who have questions, if you can raise your hand, your Zoom icon, it's the easiest way for us to see you. And we probably have time for about two questions. I just want to honor everybody's time. So uh, if you have a question, please pop up your Zoom hand. It's in the reactions button. If you click on that, it'll you'll see it says raise your hand. I, you have applause. Beth, are you asking a question or just clapping? You're muted. Oops. I was asking a question. Great. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, you're great. Go ahead. That was the closest I could see to a hand. So, <laughs> um, Mike, did you see the uh, article this week by Danny Gordis about uh, Daria Seen? I did. And that whole part of um, the uh, War of Independence and and what current thinking is on that. It's a great question. Well, as I mentioned last week, Beth, behind me on the bookshelf, there are loads of books, one of which is Danny Gordis's, um, what he calls a concise history of Israel. Again, Danny Gordis, uh, contemporary academic, the Shalem Institute in, in uh, Jerusalem, and he is a conservative ordained rabbi and he writes it's actually i get his emails every week as well very interesting um looking at things from a a, a different perspective i want to say than the pre-state establishment perspective but there's a whole group by the way of historians even in israel they're called new historians who are looking much more critically at um kind of the foundational myths of israeli society from the left of center perspective and gordas is coming more from a center right perspective um but he wrote a piece last week talking about Daria Sin, which I didn't talk about. And as I said last week, um, I don't, um, I'm, I, 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 as much as it sounds, Rabbi, that I put a lot in, there's a lot more that I didn't put in. You know, 19 years and, and 60 minutes is almost an impossible task. And the period of the War of Independence, and very little do I talk about uh, what, what happened in the wars, but the War of Independence was a fascinating piece because you had a society of 600,000 Jews, um, all of a sudden dealing with thousands of people coming every single day by boat you know to the to the to the coast and all the countries around us are attacking us and there's not enough weapons there's not enough food it's, it's a crazy situation um and leading up to the actual war midnight may 14th 15th when israel declares independence at 4 p.m on friday and the arab countries attack at midnight is a civil war that takes place from the voting of the u.n partition november 27th 29th 47 until may 14th and it's a civil war over major roads, particularly leading up to Jerusalem, over mixed cities, Hebron, Lesser Hebron, but Tiberias, Tzfat, Jerusalem, Jaffa, etc., and over Jerusalem. And in the spring, April of 1948, there is an attack on a village outside of Jerusalem called Der Yassin. And Der Yassin is kind of a, a, uh, a catchphrase which describes the atrocities perpetrated in quotes maybe by Jewish forces in the War of Independence. Um, and the numbers are all over the place. There's a new book that he talks about that suggests that I think 50 people were killed there rather than 250 people. There was no incidence of rape there, unlike the, the, uh, the, uh, the voice on, on the Arab radio saying that women, you know, every woman there was raped, 250 people were killed. Different historians, access different facts to choose to tell different stories. Um, and I personally believe that oftentimes, whether it is a guy from the left, let's say Ari Shavit, who describes this massacre that takes place in Lod, those of you who read My Promised Land probably about a decade ago, um, and Gordas speaks about this as well. I think most historians are out to prove a particular thesis slash theory and use the information that they come in the archives upon in order to prove their thesis. It's not that they're not telling the truth. It's that they're intentionally choosing to include certain information and exclude other information. Um, and what he said, and I, I give him a lot of credit for this, is we might not ever know the exact historical, empirical, objective truth what actually happened there. What is important is to understand the role of that story, that myth maybe. And when I use the word myth, I talk a lot about this when I guide in Israel, a myth is an event that might or might not have happened, 
whose significance is greater than the story itself. And in that sense, we might not ever get to the definitive historical truth of what happened at Deir Yassin, but its significance is greater than that truth itself. And the short answer is that the Irgun, the right of center military organization led by Begin, perpetrated this takeover of this community, which was essential for the as ascent up to the city of Jerusalem. There are some that say that the Haganah leadership knew what was going on beforehand and gave consent to it. Others said that they didn't know. Um, it got out of hand. That's kind of the one leg story of what happened in Darius scene. But as Gordas said to his credit, it's very much, uh, we might not know the historical truth, but the significance of the event is much greater than that. And it's fascinating because when you look at Israel today, I mean, my kids went, all graduated in school in Israel, they know what the word Nakba is. I never heard the word Nakba until 20 years ago, the catastrophe. And there's a much greater recognition in Israel. As Israel is now approaching 75 years of independence, they were able to look more critically at our foundational stories. Um, and everybody, again, is coming from their own subjective perspective as to what they want to correct. So a lot going on. And that's why, you know, when I have these presentations, I don't mind being challenged because as I keep saying, I've excluded more than I've included as much as it sounds like I put a lot in, Wendy. Thanks so much, Mike. Um, I'm gonna call it, I know I said two questions, but I just wanna honor the time because it's it's 1.07 uh, and the, the conversation is supposed to conclude at one. Um, if you have questions between, you know, for next week, please email them to me and I'm always happy to forward them to Mike. Um, wanna thank you all again for being here. Mike, you have a closing word, anything? Just didn't wanna interrupt you. Be safe. <laughs> You too. We wish everyone well, uh, good health for, for us all. And uh, Mike, God willing, we'll see you same time, same place in a week. All right. Looking Thanks, forward. Everybody. Bye.